Thank you so much, John, and thank you everybody for joining us uh, this afternoon. I think it's now afternoon everywhere in the country. Um, and I'm really pleased to, to be with you all today and uh, to be having this session. We had a very robust conversation earlier uh, with the FCC about the Affordable Connectivity Program. And so now we're going to cover a pre-enrollment assistant tool, assistant tool that um, Education Superhighway has developed. And I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, um, Jack Lynch. He is the Chief Operating Officer uh, at Education Superhighway, which for those of you who may not know, is a national nonprofit with the mission to close the digital divide for the 18 million households that have access to the internet but can't afford to connect. Education Superhighway focuses on America's most unconnected communities where more than 25% of people don't have internet access. Between 2012 and 2020, Education Superhighway helped to connect 47 million K through 12 students to the minimum speed necessary for digital learning. Jack began his career as a hardware engineer at Cisco Systems, but was driven to make a career change by a strong belief in the power of technology to create equitable opportunities for everyone. He has an electrical engineering degree from the University of Southern California's Viterbi School of Engineering. And with that, thank you so much, Jack, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today and to show us this new tool. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks for that introduction, Dina, and thanks for uh, allowing us to participate in this virtual summit. We're really excited to have the opportunity to showcase this tool that we've created and, and furthermore, just really honored to be uh, partnered with HUD on the Connect Home USA initiative. So um, with that, I'll provide just an, a little bit of additional background on Education Superhighway. So we're a national nonprofit organization. We were founded back in 2013, and our original mission was to connect all of the K-12 public schools in the country to high-speed internet access. When we started that work in 2013, less than 10% of the uh, K-12 public school buildings in the country uh, had access to the FCC's recommended uh, minimum bandwidth standards to allow for access to digital tools in the classroom and use of digital tools in the classroom. Uh, and then by 2020, that number had risen to over 99% of students having access to those speeds. And uh, the work we did in those intervening years included uh, a lot of work at the federal level, kind of evolving the federal uh, policy landscape around this issue. Um, we also partnered with all 50 states, uh, specifically with governor's offices, departments of education, departments of IT, uh, other state agencies involved in the work to launch initiatives to do this work at the state level. And uh, through that, we were partnered uh, over the course of time with over 85 different governors. Um, and, and additionally, we, we developed uh, some technology tools that helped schools become more efficient uh, procurers of high-speed internet access and allowed them to do some uh, price shopping uh, to, to get the best bang for their buck when it came to connecting their students. So um, we did that work. We were really excited uh, with the progress that was made. We were actually planning on shutting down the organization in 2020 when the pandemic hit and sort of changed our plans and changed our course. Uh, and eventually that led us to our current mission, which Dina touched on, uh, which is to connect the 18 million households in the US that have access to infrastructure, but they aren't connected to internet at home, primarily due to affordability reasons. So we call this problem the broadband affordability gap. And our focus is specifically on those uh, communities that are most unconnected, uh, which we call America's most unconnected communities. So uh, let me touch on the reason behind why we created this tool, getacp.org. And before I launch into that, I, I understand that most of the attendees here probably have at least a little bit of familiarity with the Affordable Connectivity Program. But as a quick refresher, or for those uh, that, that do have that context, or if, if you don't have that context, um, the Affordable Connectivity Program, or the ACP, was created uh, by Congress as part of the bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed in the fall of uh, 2021. And it's a $14 billion federal program. Uh, it provides $30 a month uh, off of eligible households internet access bills. Uh, and if, if uh, the household is on tribal lands, uh, that benefit increases to $75 a month. Um, the other good piece of this is that um, in partnership with the White House, uh, a number of the largest internet service providers in the country pledged to offering $30 or less plans for eligible households. So effectively 
um, the, the internet access for those households can, can be free if they're able to get on one of those plans. Um, and then the other thing I'll say just to, to kick us off is the reason this is so exciting for, um, for all of us in the HUD community is because um, one of the programs that gets you eligibility into the ACP is if you receive, if a household receives federal public housing assistance. So if you receive any type of federal public housing assistance, you are automatically eligible for the ACP. So this program is a great opportunity to uh, make sure that all of our um, HUD families are able to get connected and get online. And so Education Superhighway, we've been doing a bunch of work with communities across the country uh, since the program launched at the beginning of this year to, to really understand um, what ACP enrollment looked like at a local level and for individual households. Um, and what we found in doing this work around the country is that uh, individuals really struggled to get through the enrollment process. And there's a few key areas where the challenges were servicing. So one is navigating the application itself. Um, the application is, is pretty lengthy. There's a lot of information on it. And um, many of the households that qualify for the ACP qualify potentially through more than one uh, way. So uh, there's, I mentioned there's a number of federal benefit programs that automatically qualify you uh, for the ACP in addition to being on federal public housing assistance. Uh, if you participate in Me Medicaid, if you uh, participate in SNAP, uh, if, you if you have a child that participates in the free and reduced lunch program, um, or if you're, you qualify by income based on having a, an income that's at 200% or less of the federal poverty guidelines, those are all ways to qualify for the ACP, but uh, and many households check more than one box and the application process or, or the path to getting approved can vary based on uh, how you decide to try to qualify. And so uh, households just weren't clear on, on what path they should choose and, and the wrong choice could, <laughs> could make it a lot more uh, difficult to get through the process. The, the process itself is also very lengthy. Um, on average, we found that it takes about 35, 30 to 45 minutes to get through the process. And that's assuming that the applicant has everything they need, all the right eligibility documentation, and, and kind of knows how to answer all of the questions. Um, many times people don't have that documentation or don't know how to answer the questions and, and they you know, have to stop and start or, or, or the process can take quite a bit longer. And, and finally, and I'll touch on this a little bit more in the next slide, uh, CBOs, community-based organizations, local government institutions, people that were trying to provide support to applicants, uh, their staff that was attempting to provide the support really struggled to, to help people through the enrollment process. And, you know, this has been manifested in the, some of the stats that we've got on the right. So 45% of applications based on some data that was released earlier this year uh, were rejected and only 13% qualified via a manual uh, documentation review. So if you're not able to qualify kind of through the automated processes that have been set up, it's, it's a really low chance of success. Uh, I touched a little bit on proving eligibility, but again, that's a big pain point here. So um, there's a bunch of different documents that uh, you may need to provide to, prove, to, to show that you're eligible for the program and applicants don't always have access to those documents, know where to find them or know how to upload them. Um, and then uh, the other challenge with this process is it's really a two-step process. So you have to enroll in the ACP through the federal government uh, application, uh, but then you also have to then, once you're approved for the ACP, take a code that you're given and apply that to an internet service provider uh, with, and sign up for a regular internet service provider plan. And, and the process on the internet service provider or ISP side can be uh, equally challenging for applicants. Um, so, uh, you know, these, these are really the big issues that we've seen uh, through our work across the country. And, and I touched on this, but I wanna go into a little more detail on uh, the challenge also that not only that applicants to the program were facing, but, but people that were trying to help the applicants. So um, local institution CBOs, um, you know, in, in uh, local housing authorities, a lot of times uh, there are resident service coordinators that can help people with this sort of thing. But those types of folks were having a lot of challenges. Uh, one, due to the, the length of the application and the amount of time it takes to just help one person get through the process, um, it, it's just not very scalable for support staff. Um, a lot of times the support staff are also just not well versed themselves in the ACP application. It's, it's a bit complex, right? And so uh, if you don't have some detailed training and experience, it's, it's, it's uh, tough to get through or tough to help someone get through. And then language barriers were a big thing that we observed. So there's, I, I think, something like over 200 spoken languages in the United States. Um, 
you know, the, the applications available in English and Spanish. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, there are additional languages that need to be supported. And a lot of times support staff doesn't necessarily speak the same language as the person they're trying to help. So kind of seeing all of these issues and, and wanting to figure out a way that we could uh, tackle those issues, uh, we decided at Education Superhighway to create a, uh, a tool, an application assistant that could help people with this enrollment process. And that's uh, why we decided to create getacp.org. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my presentation right now and go over to a live demo. So please just bear with me for a second while I switch the screens. Okay, so uh, the, the getacp.org website should be coming through. So um, this URL is live. Uh, if people want to, you know, log on to your own device and, and follow along with me, that's totally fine. Uh, the URL again is getacp.org. And I am showing you this on my desktop, but we did create this tool to be optimized for a mobile experience. So if you want to uh, try it out on your phone or mobile tablet, uh, that's the way we envision that most people applying for the ACP are going to be interacting with this tool and with the application itself. Uh, a large number of, of the individuals in, in the U.S. that don't have Internet access, they do have a smartphone. And so um, this again, that's, that, that was taken into account when we developed this tool. So uh, here on the landing page, uh, this is where people will uh, will go when they get directed to getacp.org. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and click get started. So uh, on the first screen, we ask people for uh, their language preference. And right now we have four languages uh, in this tool. So we have English, Spanish, uh, traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese. We do plan to add more and more languages over time, um, but, but these are the ones we have currently. And uh, so I'll go ahead and click English for the purposes of this demo. So uh, that'll take you to a screen that talks about uh, getting started and, and explaining why we're gonna ask you some of the questions we're gonna ask you. And uh, I just wanna touch on some of the design uh, principles that we uh, tried to follow in, in the development of this tool. So we tried to make this tool to the extent possible uh, friendly, approachable, you know, kind of uh, informal. Uh, we wanted it to be encouraging to the applicants and we wanted it to be easy. Um, so this is a bit of a contrast from, from the application on the FCC's website where, um, you know, a lot of the feedback we were getting from, from individuals was uh, the information presented was overwhelming. It, it was a bit intimidating. Um, and, and the process itself we know is, is challenging to get through. So we're trying to uh, address that with some of the design choices we've made and user experience choices we've made in this tool. Um, so I'll go ahead and click continue. Uh, the next thing we're gonna ask for is the applicant zip code. And um, there's a few reasons why we asked for zip code. Um, reason number one is that some of the um, programs that get you eligibility into the ACP uh, are dependent on uh, state or even even you know uh, a local level um, uh, of, of kind of how that program is implemented, and so asking for zip code kind of allows us to calibrate the rest of the, the questions we're going to ask based on where the applicants uh, coming to us from. And the other big reason why we ask for zip code is uh, this tool at the end of the process. You'll see this in a minute provides guidance on internet service provider plans that are available to that applicant in their area. So. Uh, zip code allows us to to uh, give a kind of tailored list to the person that's trying to apply. So I'm going to put in my own zip code. I live in the DC area. Um, okay, and then the next thing that we ask is, are you already a subscriber to Lifeline? Lifeline is another program from the FCC that's been around for a lot longer than the ACP. And uh, if you're already uh, part of the Lifeline program, you are automatically qualified for the ACP and you don't actually have to go through the application process again. Uh, we're asking this question first because if the answer to this question is yes, that is the easiest uh, scenario to deal with. Um, but you know, many people are not participating in Lifeline or or might not know. Uh, we've got some help uh, helpers here on the page if they want more information. But I'm going to go ahead and click no for the demo. Um, and then the next thing we're going to do is start asking about other ways that someone might qualify for the ACP. Um, so again, there's a number of of kind of federal benefits programs that could help someone qualify for the ACP. Um, we have, again, consciously not presented all of them at once to the applicant, um, and we've also prioritized these, uh, the, the choices we're, we're offering um, in the way that we've found so far makes for the most streamlined process for getting approved to the ACP. So um, SNAP and WIC, uh, kind of the, the, the food stamps programs, are, are 
some of the easiest and more straightforward ways for to get qualified for the ACP. So that's why we're asking for those programs first. Um, but then if, if, if an applicant uh, doesn't have those options, uh, they can show more options. And you'll see on the next screen, federal housing benefits is one of the, the options that we present. Um, you'll see, you can see some of the other uh, scenarios that might present themselves. And if none of those are, are options for the particular user, you can um, say, show me more options. And then we're going to start to ask some questions that uh, might allow us uh, to, to qualify someone based on income or, um, or potentially based on some other uh, programs that are a little less straightforward than the ones that have been shown. So you can select how many people in your household, um, you know, uh, try to understand whether or not your income is within the right range. Um, that'll take you down that path. I'm going to go back a few screens and just show the, the journey through um, federal housing benefits, since that is uh, applicable to this audience. So you can see encouraging text that shows up on the on the screen for the user. Um, eventually, in most of these paths, you're, the user is going to be asked how they want to confirm their identity. Now, uh, at this stage, we're not going to actually ask for this information ourselves uh, through our education superhighways tool. Um, but we want to, you know, set the expectation that um, the the applicants either going to have to provide the last four digits of their social security number, or they might need to, uh, if they don't want to do that, there's there's some other uh, options. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and, and use the uh, social security number. Um, and uh, then you get the message, great, you're now sort of ready to start the actual ACP application process. And what we do is, um, well, there's one more question I forgot about that we squeezed in here. So we also want to understand how many people that are using this tool do or don't have home internet access. So that is one last question uh, that the user answers. Uh, I'll go ahead and say yes. Um, and then what we do is we generate a checklist for the user. So it's on the screen here. We give them all the information that they are going to need to be able to successfully get through the ACP application process, uh, a little bit of information about what to expect, and uh, a link to um, the actual ACP application. They can link into it directly from this tool. Uh, additionally, I uh, alluded to this earlier, but we're gonna show the user the internet plans that are available in their area that they could use with the ACP. And we have again, prioritized this list of plans based on um, kind of the quality of the, the plans, the amount of speed they're offering, but also ones that are going to be free after the ACP benefits been, been applied. So, um, that list of uh, that all that information is displayed on the screen. The user can also save the screen as a PDF if they want to. They can have this list emailed to them. And if they are so moved, they can give us some feedback about the tool itself. Um, before I end this quick demo, I also do want to point out that we have uh, a chat functionality in the tool as well. So um, if a user gets stuck at any point or wants some more information, wants to interact uh, with someone about this, they can click the chat button. And um, initially, there's a set of kind of common questions that, that we've loaded into the chat that people might have and, and, and um, it, more of a chatbot type response. But if, if someone clicks, I have a different question, um, they will actually start to engage with a live agent uh, on our side. Um, and they can they can interact with that agent and ask any questions that they have. Um, Right now, our live chat is staffed from 9 to 5 p.m. PST, but we do plan on expanding those uh, support hours um, over time and, and in the near future. And um, if someone does try to uh, engage with the chat uh, outside of those hours, they'll have an option to, to receive a call back or a text back from our uh, contact center. So I am going to go ahead and end this demo there, and I'll jump back into the slide presentation. I just have a couple more slides to get to before we get into Q&A. OK, so we should be back on the presentation. Um, so just want to touch on some of the planned feature improvements. Um, uh, one is uh, right now, uh, this is really a pre-enrollment tool. So it's, it's a tool, it's an assistant that's meant to help people get ready for the ACP application and give them a better chance of successfully getting through the process once they go to apply. It is not the application itself, um, but we do have um, a plan to, to over time integrate with the FCC's national verifier and, and, and uh, get more integrated into the application itself and, and make this more of a seamless experience for users. And, uh, part of that is actually going to come through the Your Home, Your Internet pilot program, which will allow us to um, 
uh, to go down this road, uh, but we're really excited to continue to enhance the tool in that way. Um, we're also gonna add an opt-in um, uh, collection of user contact information. Um, and the reason we, we wanna do that, we don't have that now. Right now we're not collecting any sort of contact information from the users. We wanna create the option for a user to give us their contact information because we wanna provide additional support after people leave our tool. So follow up with them to see if they were able to get successfully get through the process, see if they were successfully able to uh, enroll in an IFP plan, and if not, provide them additional support in getting through those parts of the process. And then, you know, I mentioned we want to add more languages over time, better documentation support, and expanded life support options. So uh, these are just a few of the, the planned feature improvements that we uh, hope to um, incorporate into the tool. And uh, finally, this is my last slide. Um, wanted to highlight a few different ways that local housing authorities can partner with us to, uh, to make sure that uh, this tool is getting in the hands of the people that need it. Um, one is to embed a link to the tool on your website. Uh, we uh, have some uh, materials on our website about uh, different ways to do that. And that brings up the next point. So um, we have something called an HCP resource hub at educationsuperhighway.org. And uh, there's plenty of templates for communications materials that, uh, you know, housing authorities and, and, and other groups can use uh, to kind of communicate some of these resources to your beneficiaries. Um, and then finally, you know, providing training to resident service coordinators on both the tool and the ACP enrollment uh, process overall and how, how they can best support uh, folks on, on getting through that process. Uh, and, and on that note, we are also developing on-demand training videos, and those should be coming soon within the next month or two, we hope, uh, uh, to educationsuperhighway.org. So uh, just a few ways that we can uh, continue to work together on all this. And with that, I think we're ready for questions, uh, Dina. Thank you so much, Jack. That is really amazing. And it's amazing to see, I didn't actually realize how comprehensive this, not only the tool, but the work that you're going to be doing, like the, the on-demand videos that you mentioned. I think that that's really, really great. Um, so we do have some questions, which I will read. Um, one is, uh, is the chat function supported uh, in other words, does the chat function support the language that the individual first selected when they when they first get to the tool? Yeah, great question. So uh, right now, our contact center can support English and Spanish. We are uh, working hard to bring in uh, support for, for the Chinese languages that we're supporting right now. And um, again, we, we hope to continue to expand those capabilities over time. But for right now, it's English and Spanish for live support. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next question is, how do ISP vendors get on your list? Yeah, so um, a few different ways, um, and, and we are trying to be comprehensive about who we're including uh, on the list, um, but we, um, you know, we, we use right now FCC Form 470 information, which probably doesn't mean anything to anyone here unless they're an ISP, uh, but that's a, that's a way that, that ISPs kind of report their coverage areas. Uh, that's part of the equation. We also have relationships with a number of the large ISPs in the country, most pretty much all of the, of the, the uh, uh, biggest ISPs. Um, and, and work with them to make sure our ISP plan information is accurate. But then additionally, um, you know, we, uh, we provide options for ISPs to basically uh, send us information that, that once we, we have, we will include and make sure it's reflected uh, on, on our list. Um, and so, um, let's see, I don't think I'm missing anything. There. Th those are, those are the, the, the ways that we make sure that we have up-to-date ISP plan information. Perfect. Um, are you, the next question is, are you working on group training slash at once live enrollment programs? Let's see, group training or at once live enrollment Yeah, I'm not programs. sure what that means. Uh, well, what I think it might mean is um, group training. Well, maybe that's like a webinar. Um, and and, and there's, there's a few different trainings. I, I'm going to assume that this is talking about training people who are going to provide support for others. Um, so we have been doing webinars. We plan to have some live webinars uh, in the future, but our, mostly we plan, plan to have kind of uh, this on-demand, these on-demand videos that we want to uh, put mm -hmm. out there that it'll be really easy for people to use. Um, and I'm not sure about at once live enrollment programs, but hopefully that that answers the question. Maybe that means uh, enrollment, actual enrollment events, ACP enrollment events. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. So um, we have attended several of those events are already. Um, and I think there's there's definitely a value that live events can have. What we've found is is live ACP enrollment events 
They're really effective for getting the word out and getting excitement around the ACP. They have been less useful from our perspective on actually getting people enrolled because mm -hmm. of how long it takes to, to, to actually enroll in the process. And so um, we're, we're kind of thinking of that as, as, again, maybe part one in a process where it's a good way to kind of get people Generate interested, get interest. people started, but, but making sure that we have a good plan in place to follow up with people that come to the event and actually help them through the process. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, the, there's a question from, maybe it might be from an ISP. Who do mm -hmm. ISPs contact to get on your list? Yeah, so um, the, the best place to uh, reach out would be info at educationsuperhighway.org. Great, thank you. Um, info at educationsuperhighway.org. Okay, um, then Chris Natesway asks, if someone already has internet service, can they still take advantage of the program and do they have to give up the service plan they already have to join the service plans offered with the program? Thank you. Yeah, um, so the answer is, uh, yeah, they can. yes, they can still take advantage of the program and no, they don't have to give up the service that they already have. So um, the, 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 this program was designed to be a, a discount on internet bills and um, it is not restrictive in terms of as long as the internet service provider who you have a plan with is participating in the AC group program and the vast majority of internet service providers out there are participating in the program, um, you can still uh, sign up for this if you're eligible and still get $30 a month off your bill. Right, perfect, thanks Jack. Um, okay, Abe asks, I didn't see an option to take advantage of the additional $100 device or find out which ISPs accept that part of the deal. It's not the biggest of things to worry about, but something to consider to get devices in the hands of residents. Yeah, that's a good point. Sure, term. sure. Yeah, and I, I didn't really touch on that, but that is another part of the ACP program is this device credit. Unfortunately, not very many ISPs have been participating in that part of the program, which has, uh, you know, been part of the challenge. Um, and, and we probably need to have a separate webinar to talk about all the, all the reasons for that and what might be done about it. But, um, you know, right now our tool is focused on the internet access part of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's kind of what uh, the information is limited to for, for getacp.org. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Jack. I will say we are going to have a session with the six ISPs that are our Connect Home USA stakeholders on Thursday afternoon. So if you want to ask this question of them, you might want to join us then. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Let's let me do a quick time check. We are basically at time. Jack, thank you so much for this really comprehensive overview of your tool and information about ACP. Really appreciate it. And I'm thrilled about our partnership. Um, breaking news, everyone, our deputy secretary signed the MOU that we have with Education Superhighway just this morning. And we are hoping to have it fully implemented within I don't know, the next 24 hours, I suppose. But um, thank you so much. And, and I'd like to show you what's up next. Um, we're going to have a half hour break and then join us uh, later for in, at four o'clock Eastern time for two strategies to enhance broadband adoption. So these topics are by popular demand. This is something you all asked us for. So we're delivering. Uh, Digital Navigators is one session and telehealth approaches. We have wonderful speakers for both sessions. Um, so pick the one that you're most interested in and we will see you there. And Jack, again, many, many thanks to you for taking time to be with us today. Really appreciate it. And I look forward to working with you in the future. Oh, likewise. And thanks for having me, Dana. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great afternoon. Take care, everyone. See you shortly. Bye-bye.